here in our line again here on this Tuesday morning. Jim Brassingham back here with you. We'll be talking Virginia sports, a lot of sports, a lot of football and baseball. Now with Chris Graham of the Augusta Free Press, we'll take a quick look at high school, college football, of course, also the pros, the replacement referees, maybe even a touch on the Washington Nationals and the Baltimore Orioles for baseball at the very end. But really quick, college football, uh, Chris, uh, UVA uh, continuing to struggle. The uh, Cavaliers get Louisiana Tech on Saturday, a home game, but they're already about a three-and-a-half point underdog right now in Virginia Tech. Coming off uh, the pummeling of Bowling Green goes to Cincinnati. Uh, they'll be taking on Cincinnati. I think that's at FedEx Field, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, right now, surprisingly, Cincinnati's having a pretty decent year, and Tech's almost a touchdown favorite. Yeah, well, and Cincinnati uh, beat the team that beat Virginia Tech. So, you know, using that reasoning, uh, you know, Cincinnati could fare well in this game. Cincinnati beat Pittsburgh earlier in the season 34-10. The next week, Pittsburgh went out and beat Virginia Tech 35-17. So, you know, that's, that's hard to make that logic because obviously it's, it's the clash on the field that matters the most. But uh, you have to think that, that, that Cincinnati is going to give Virginia Tech a test in this ball game. And, you know, Virginia Tech, that went over Bowling Green, you know, they did what they needed to do, 37 nothing win, but they didn't. They had one first down in the first quarter. They, they struggled in the first half. You know, Logan Thomas continues to, to struggle a bit at quarterback, which is interesting. He seems to have taken maybe a slight step back from where he was last year. He had a great sophomore season. Now as a junior, I think expectations were really high for him and this offense, and the offense is, is right now a weak point for this Virginia Tech team. And, and you know, Cincinnati can be very interesting. It's a neutral field game. I expect a lot of Hokies fans will be at FedEx Field, but, uh, you know, don't uh, don't look past Cincinnati. I think, obviously, the Virginia Tech football team will not. They, they, they I think, will admit they looked past Pittsburgh and, and thought that Pittsburgh team that was 0-2 going into that game uh, would, would be an easy out, and, and we're not. So, uh, you know, certainly Cincinnati will have the attention of the Hokies this weekend. You know, Denver, I guess this is a Virginia Tech just based on the line now. Virginia Tech will come to play and win on Saturday, but if they don't, uh, boy, you're going to hear about it. You, Yeah, no question. They'd be 0-2 in the Big East, if you want to say. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't want to assume that Virginia Tech's going to come out and win. I still think that the identity of this Virginia Tech team is very much at question. They, they did beat Georgia Tech in Week 1. Uh, you know, Georgia Tech, you know, of course, has blown out Virginia, but then they lost over the weekend to Miami, a Miami team that itself had come off to a rough start. So uh, we really, I, I don't know that we know where Virginia Tech is right now. Our, our, you know, right now what defines them is that win over Georgia Tech, but maybe Georgia Tech is a step back from where we thought they were. And, and certainly, you know, that loss to Pittsburgh still kind of rings uh, really loud right now for people who observe Virginia Tech football. So this weekend will go a long way to telling us you know, at the end of the month of September, where this Virginia Tech football team stands. You all, the Cavaliers starting 2-0, have lost a few, uh, losing to uh, TCU. Really couldn't get any offense going. Uh, the defense looked like they played halfway decently, good enough to win. Maybe if the offense comes to play last Saturday. Now they get Louisiana Tech, a team that just rolled over the fighting line night last weekend. It's a home game for Virginia Tech. A lot of people before the season probably thought, ah, Tech by, I mean, uh, it's a home game for UVA. And probably before the season, a lot of people thought, you know, UVA by 7 to 10 points over Louisiana Tech. And as we mentioned at the very beginning of our segment today, uh, Louisiana Tech's the favorite, about 3.5 points right now. Yeah, and you mentioned Virginia struggling on offense against TCU. Really, that's a, a theme for the season now. They scored 43 in the opening win over Richmond, a 1AA team that, you know, is, is what, Virginia did what they were supposed to in that game. But since then, the offense has really struggled. They struggled in a win over Penn State. They, they couldn't move the ball consistently against Georgia Tech, and they had seven points against TCU. Now, TCU's got a, you know, top 10 defense nationally. So sure. that's not a surprise in one sense. But what is a surprise is I think a lot of people, including me, going into the season thought, well, the defense will be a problem. And the defense has been a problem. They've given up uh, uh, you know, 99 points in their last three games uh, and, and 56 in that game against uh, Georgia Tech. I think, though, a lot of folks thought, and again, including me, that the offense would score. I, I expected this offense to be a team that would score over 30 points a game. And uh, you know, to see the offense struggling the way they have, they had four turnovers in that narrow 17-16 win over Penn State. They couldn't move the ball against Georgia Tech until late in that game when it was you know garbage time. And a, another garbage time touchdown gets them the only points of the game against TCU. Uh, you know, the offense is really not, you know, really, really, you know, I talk about Logan Thomas taking a step back. The Virginia offense has taken a huge step back. Last year, they were a team that could be counted on to score in most games 30 points a game. And, and this year, 
Bill Lazor's offense uh, is not clicking on any cylinder. Last year, they seemed to have the running game really going really well. Uh, a lot of people thought going into the season that they had maybe the best offensive line in the ACC, if not the best, maybe second best, maybe, maybe in competition with Florida State. The offensive line has massively underperformed. They're not protecting Michael Rocco. Michael Rocco's not making good decisions. He's turned the ball over a lot, fumbling and throwing interceptions. His receivers are dropping passes that uh, they should be catching. And so the offense is not clicking. The defense is, is, is performing as expected, not very well. And yeah, going into this weekend with Louisiana Tech, who won 52-24 at Illinois last week, Louisiana Tech's 3-0. They're defending uh, Western Athletic Conference WAC champions. And for, for Louisiana Tech, you know, a win this weekend puts them to 4-0. and And they're thinking, hey, maybe we could be BCS busters. So uh, they come into this game with everything to lose. And Virginia, uh, I, I think, very well comes out of this weekend with a losing record. Hey, uh, looking at some of the other ACC results from last weekend, what shocked you the most? I mean, first of all, Clemson's defense just folded up, it looked like, in the second half against Florida State. Maryland, I thought, uh, played West Virginia very tough, and I was shocked that Miami, a uh, program that uh, seemed to be struggling, went to Georgia Tech and outscored them like that, especially after Georgia Tech had come back from a deficit and took, a, I think they scored 36 straight points, trailing 19 nothing maybe. Yeah, it was, yeah. A 36 to 19 lead, and then... That, after that, uh, Miami makes the comeback. Yeah, it was it was 19-0 Miami in the first quarter, uh, and, and then, as you mentioned, 36 straight points by Georgia Tech. You don't see very many games where a team scores 36 straight points and loses, but uh, Miami's defense clamped down in the fourth quarter, and their offense clicked in the fourth quarter and in overtime as well. And the defense got the big stop in overtime, uh, stopping Georgia Tech on a fourth and short. Uh, and, and then uh, the offense scores on, on the first possession of overtime. And that's the surprise to me. There were a lot of interesting games in the ACC this weekend. But that Miami team, just a couple weeks ago, had lost at Kansas State 52-13. to Now, Kansas State beat Oklahoma this past weekend. So Kansas State is, a, is definitely a top-10 team. And who knows, they might be playing for the national championship with some assistance. Yeah, that's right. So, so to lose to Kansas State is, is is no, you know, it's it's not it's not a mark on your record, a bad mark on your record. But to lose fifty two thirteen to anybody uh, is is not is is you know is not good for your record either in that sense. So, so for Miami to come back from getting pounded a couple of weeks ago and and then to play a team like Georgia Tech that you know they came in riding high, they had just beaten Virginia fifty six to twenty, and uh, very close loss. And Virginia Tech could have easily won that game too. They should yeah, very well should have won that game. So, uh, so yeah, that's the surprise to me. Now, you mentioned the, the Clemson-Florida State game. Uh, you know, I think the score of that game was 21-14 Clemson at halftime, and Florida State ends up scoring 49 points to 35 points in the second half. Uh, that's a surprise. I mean, it, it, my, Florida State's offense can put up big numbers. We knew that going in. I just I was surprised in in that context of that ball game that Clemson, as you, I think you put it well, Clemson's defense folded in the second half, and Florida State scored it well. That game against West Virginia a little bit. Hey, really quick, when it comes to Florida State, is this a national championship team? I mean, can this team, again, maybe with uh, some help from uh, an SEC loss or two, I suppose, whatever it takes, can this team wind up and win the national championship game? I, I think so. Talent-wise, we a lot of us who cover the ACC regularly and closely have thought for a couple of years that Jimbo Fisher had the talent in that program to compete for a national championship. They had injury issues, uh, and then they just you know had some a you know, couple of bad breaks. Last year, the loss to Clemson was was just a game that they had a chance to win, and on the road in a tough place, they lost. Uh, but I think a lot of us have thought talent-wise they were they were in they could be in that mix. Well, now you got EJ Manuel, the quarterback's a senior. He's he's got a lot of experience. Um, again. I mentioned that their offensive line, you know, going into the season was looked at as one of the best two offensive lines in the ACC. Certainly they're the best offensive line in the ACC right now. So they got a good quarterback, a good running game. Their defense is pretty stout. Now they gave up 37 points to Clemson, but, you know, that Clemson offense is, is, is high power. I expect this Florida State defense, for the most part of the season, will, you know, will hold teams down pretty pretty significantly. And so what Florida State needs to happen, because they're, they're number four in the country. They've got a good head start, if you want to say, as, as we get ready for play in the, the end of September going into October. Over. They need Virginia Tech, actually, of all things. Virginia Tech needs to, to, you know, win some ball games here and, you know, win this weekend and win through October because there's a big game in Blacksburg first Thursday in November uh, where Florida State travels to Virginia Tech. I think from the standpoint of their national resume, Florida State would need, you know, need to go in there and obviously win that game, but they need to win a game against a Virginia Tech team that itself has a good resume. So, um, 
I think that if you see Florida State go into Virginia Tech, win that game, I think you can expect, the way things are shaking out in the Coastal Division right now, I think Virginia Tech's the class of the Coastal, you may see Florida State have two shots at Virginia Tech. And I think they're going to need that resume padding, if you want to say, uh, to, to maybe jump in and, and break through the mix of the SEC teams that are in the top five right now. But I think they could. I think certainly they, on the field, Florida State can compete for a national championship. And if they can get maybe a couple of wins over Virginia Tech, I think they can work their way into that ballgame. Yeah, and again, Maryland played uh, the Mountaineers pretty tough. I know, surprisingly, and it actually, uh, you know, held held the Mountaineers down offensively. If you want to say scoring 31 points in the game is a good defensive effort, uh, it was. They it was it was a close game throughout. I think it was 17-14 in halftime. Maryland stayed with West Virginia throughout, and a lot of people were surprised by that. I was surprised by that. Uh, uh, you know, Maryland going in, of course, they they had narrowly defeated uh, William and Mary seven to six in their opener, and. Uh, you know, they lost to uh, recently to, to Connecticut, uh, a, a you know, lower echelon Big East team this year. And so, you know, to go in and, and play West Virginia, I think folks thought that that was going to be a huge blowout, and Maryland was very competitive. So actually, you know, for the rest of the ACC, including teams like Virginia, Virginia, I think it's it's next weekend Virginia has Maryland coming into town. Um, you know, that's Maryland maybe is, is, is starting to get things right, and uh, – you know, for for the, their ACC foes, it's it's maybe the worst time because this Maryland team, uh, you know, v- was very vulnerable early on, but they're looking pretty good right now. Any other ACC matchups this coming weekend uh, on Saturday that you'll really be focused on? Uh, you know, the, with the ACC, I think it's a quiet weekend, but uh, certainly uh, this is the last weekend where you see, you know, a lot of non-conference games. I think as we get into October, that's when things start getting really interesting. I know I've looked at Virginia's schedule out. Uh, they got Maryland and Wake Forest in early October. Uh, then Virginia's got a 12-day th- a, a stretch. They have a th- Because they have a Thursday game, they've got at NC State, then they've got uh, uh, Miami at home, and then North Carolina at home in a 12-day period. Uh, so that, that's what makes this weekend key for Virginia. They, they need a win, and it's going to be tough to get with Louisiana Tech in town, but you know, they need a win this weekend because Maryland and Wake, obviously, uh, are going to be tough games. And, and then that stretch there at the, you know, the, start of, the end of October and start of November, very tough stretch. Um, I think for Virginia Tech this weekend is pretty key, too. Again, we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Cincinnati uh, is, is not going to be an easy win, even with the odds makers making it a touchdown uh, a margin right now. Uh, Virginia Tech, though, would, you know, very much needs a win to go 4-1 and one into October, and, and then they can focus on the ACC. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, stakes on these two non-conference games for our in-state teams this weekend. By the way, uh, JMU and VMI, really quick, uh, JMU continues to uh, get some victories along the way, and VMI, after starting, you know, uh, really two close games to begin the season, splitting their first two games to go 1-1, one one, I believe, in the last uh, two games, they've been outscored now, I believe it's 88-9. to nine. Yeah, they had a three early 3 nothing lead over Navy and then lost that game. They were on the national TV, CBS uh, College Sports Network, and so they got some exposure, which... You know, it's always helpful uh, as far as recruiting goes. But, uh, you know, Navy Navy did what a lot of people thought they'd do. They, they, they beat them pretty handily. JMU, JMU was surprising in a sense. They went to Rhode Island, and, and uh, Justin Thorpe, the quarterback, had a career day passing the ball. Mickey Matthews' offense usually is a – they, they, they run out of the shotgun, and they, they spread the field wide with, with three and four and five receivers, but they often run the ball out of that set. And Thorpe threw for over 300 yards, threw the ball 40 times in the air. So what JMU showed – future opponents is that, uh, okay, we can run the ball. We've already proven we can run the ball on you, but if you stack the line on us, we'll throw the ball over your heads, too. So that could be very interesting for the future. The win over Rhode Island, otherwise, not you know, not much to say about. And let's go across the state to ODU. I don't know if you saw the result of that game. They played, New, oh, yeah. they played New Hampshire. When I first saw the score, I didn't keep up with it during the day on Saturday, I saw the score 64-61, and I thought, well, first, I thought, are they playing basketball already? I didn't realize it was you know, basketball. I was, I was uh, reading the box score of that, trying to picture the New Hampshire radio broadcasters like in the third quarter or whatever it was going, well, we're on top 54 to 35. Looks like we got this one in the back. Well, and, and then I'm thinking, okay, so after after the joking reference to basketball, I'm thinking that game must have gone about seven or eight overtimes, you know, because a three-point margin, you see 64-61, you're thinking maybe that game was 27-27 in their regulation, and they played eight or nine overtimes. It was, What's it was, uh, amazing is that ODU actually had a 61 to 54 lead after trailing most of the day and then had to get the field goal late to win it because uh 
Hampshire came back with a tying touchdown. I guess it's not surprising, you know, in that kind of game that that would be the case. But, yeah, New Hampshire actually had to rally after being up 54-35 in the third quarter uh, to tie that game up and, and, and make it a, a game late. Uh, but, you know, uh, ODU gives up 40 points in the first half, and they were down 40-24. to 24. Uh, so The quarterback, Heineke, threw for, what, was it 730 yards? Like 730 yards, yeah. Uh, breaking a record held, a Division One record held uh, previously by David Klingler, the uh, former prolific uh, uh, University of Houston 1A quarterback from about 20 years ago or so. Yeah, I think the, well, his top receiver, if I read the box score correctly, if I remember correctly, had like 230 yards of receiving and either two or three touchdowns receiving. Yeah, yeah, and... and uh, so the thing, you know, you take out of that, okay, we can score 64 points in a game. Also, your defense can give up 61 points in a game. Now, New Hampshire is a top 20 uh, 1AA program as well. So it was a, a game between two, you know, uh, top-ranked teams, so to speak, in, in 1AA football. But uh, for ODU, you know, you get the win, you're happy, you love all the yards passing and the total offense and everything else. But obviously, if you're ODU, you can't go out and, and be that vulnerable on defense. So, um, you know, some things to show up there. But from a standpoint of fans, uh, you can't be too upset to see that much scoring going on, I suppose. Hey, high school football, too. Uh, you know, I saw the big game in Augusta County last week was uh, Lee beating Fort Defiance. Fort's really kind of struggling right now. They started the season 2-0. and Rockridge beat them, and they've lost a few now. And, uh, and right now, I guess, in the Valley District up there to the north of us, it looks like uh, it may come down to Harrisonburg and Lee. And you'd probably have to figure Harrisonburg because Lee had its own props at times. Yeah, yeah. Well, Harrisonburg is looking pretty solid right now. Yeah, Lee Lee has been inconsistent, even though I think they're four and one. But you know, they, they had a narrow win over uh, Wilson Memorial, a one A team. Even though, or, or, I'd love to see what Wilson could have done in the Valley District this year. The way they're playing right now, they they lost to Lee at close game. They blew out Spotswood. Uh, so and they, and they beat Waynesboro. So they've actually they're actually two and one in the Valley. If they wanted to say that. Uh, but yeah, Lee, Lee and Harrisonburg, and unless Harrisonburg suffers a significant injury or two, I think that Harrisonburg would have the advantage right now. But we're heading into the heart of the season now. We're in the second half of the season, and we're heading into you know the the, the, the throws of district play. And you mentioned Fort was Fort was interesting. They had a couple of I thought you know really you know nice wins in the start of the season. Now they're two and three. Uh, Rockbridge started that trend for for for, for Fort Defiance. So um, uh, you know that's that's the. But that's that's where things can go. You can be two and zero on top of the world, and just like that, you can be looking up, looking up. But uh, um, as far as that goes, there's, there's still a lot to be a lot to be decided here. There's still five games for for everybody else out there, so there's still a lot of opportunity to to you know, turn things around. But uh, you know, this week this week will be very key uh, as as a lot of teams uh, you know get into the heart of their schedule district wise, uh, including Ford, including Lee. There, this is going to be an opportunity to either. You know, make your start making your stretch run, or you know, maybe it's time to get ready for next year. And lastly, when it comes to uh, before we switch gears and talk baseball, NFL uh, third placement referee is obviously the number one story in the NFL. The regional teams, Baltimore, and uh, also the Washington Redskins. The uh, Ravens were able to beat the New England on Sunday with a very questionable field goal. The Redskins have now lost two in a row. Now, needless to say, they don't have much defense, but there were a lot of Questionable calls in their loss to the Bengals. Uh, we had the game last night, Green Bay, Seattle. Green Bay fans thought they got ripped off. We had some questionable calls in the Detroit, uh, Tennessee overtime thriller, which Tennessee was able to hang on. So, I mean, we got a lot of questionable calls from the referees, Chris, and that's one thing. But when uh, these calls are occurring in game-changing situations like the Detroit, Tennessee penalty and the lack of a correct call, perhaps, at the Green Bay, Seattle game, I mean, uh, they're really deciding ball games now. They are the, the the two, especially the two primetime games this week. Sunday night, the the big one, uh, Baltimore getting the, and it's hard to argue uh, if if the call had gone, if if the ruling on the field and on that Baltimore uh, game winning field goal had been that the kick was no good, then you know Baltimore fans would be the ones upset. But you couldn't review that either. I know it, 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 we had rule changes back in 1965 after you know, Baltimore got ripped off and they lost in the playoffs to Green Bay. They uh, they moved the uh, goalpost back. They raised the post. And I'm thinking just get a good feel as to what's the highest a kid could go across the goalpost and then raise him to that level. Exactly. You know, with especially that was a short field goal. I think it was a 22, 23 yard field goal. Yeah. So you can expect that the kick will be higher at its apex going across the the goalpost. Go, uh, the, uh, the yeah, the goalpost. Because uh, you know he's he's he doesn't have to worry about uh, the distance or anything else. So yeah, uh, you know I've only seen in, 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 I know kicks can be reviewed, but not 
that particular kick because it was right over top of the goalpost. I saw a game a few years ago when Al Grove was still the coach of Virginia. He challenged a kick uh, in a game against Carolina, North Carolina, at, on the road in Chapel Hill. Uh, the ruling on the field was that a kick had gone over the crossbar. It was pretty obvious from TV replays that the kick had not crossed the crossbar. It was actually short, but the officials had ruled it good, uh, and, and the re- officials actually reversed it. I've never seen otherwise a, a kick, a, a call on a kick either either good or no good reversed in a situation like that. But it looked to me like, you know, live that night and then after watching replays, that kick was no good, and certainly the Patriots well, players thought it was. Camera angles, I guess, to really definitively right. say it. I'm thinking if you raise the bar as high as you think a kick can go, uh, then it would, it would be, I uh, would think, pretty definitive. Yeah, and, and I think and then, you, know, you fast forward to last night's game, the folks who stayed up late to watch the, uh, the end of the Seattle Green Bay game, uh, there were a couple of issues on that last play. Golden Tate, and we've talked about this uh, before we got on the air here, but Golden Tate, the receiver for the Seahawks, not only did he you know, not make the catch, and the Green Bay player actually made the interception, and then Tate stuck his hand in, and they called that a simultaneous possession for the touchdown, but Tate, right before the ball got to that area where the, the, the ball was caught, uh, was was blatantly pushing the, a Green Bay defender in front of him, uh, what would be an obvious pass interference call. And that's not reviewable, and also not reviewable is a simultaneous catch. If the ruling on the field is a simultaneous catch, then you can't review that. So, um, so what, what we come down to is you know, a couple of situations where referees, in the Baltimore New England case, I think it's, you can say it's questionable whether the call was botched. Um, I think it was a judgment call, could have gone either way, and certainly depending on what team you're a fan of, you thought the ball was botched or it was a great call. The game last night was 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 not. It was it was botched. But neither one of those situations were reviewable. They just missed it live. And that's all we've been talking about preseason and the first three weekends of the regular season is that these replacement refs have come from lower level college football and in some cases high school football, uh, and that the speed of the game will be an issue. And when you're talking about making, it's not just about the, how fast the players are running. It's about how fast things happen and how quickly you need to make decisions. And it's clear from a number of games this weekend. Uh, and also the two high-profile primetime games this weekend that, that these guys just can't hack it. And nothing against them personally. They're trying their hearts out, but it's hurting the quality of the product on the field. And I can't imagine that uh, there's not a lot of people talking right now, as we're talking in the NFL offices, about what they need to do to improve the quality of the product on the field. Well, what do you expect? Uh, is this going to be incentive to really make a deal as quickly as possible with the regular refs, or will the powers that be in the NFL say, hey, we've Maybe three, three weeks, we'll just keep going. Uh, I, I, the, the hard part is, there, there's one hard part, is that uh, there's a game every Thursday night now. The, the, you know, it used to be that those Thursday night games didn't start until the second half of the season. If you're going to make a change, you have to make it before the whole week starts, and the week starts on Thursday. So, uh, you know, the pressure from last night, I think, is going to be very intense. The public pressure on the NFL is going to be extremely intense. I just don't know from what I'm hearing that there is a lot of movement between the, the differences between the NFL Referees Association and the NFL over the what's, what's kept them apart for the first three weeks of the regular season. Um, so it could be that we're going to be stuck with these guys for at least another week. I know that you know the reports have been that the NFL contracted the replacement officials that they hired for the first five weeks of the regular season. So it's very possible that you know we're going to see at least two more weeks of this stuff. And you know maybe the NFL perversely likes the negative attention because it's, it's got people talking about the NFL. But to me, it's kind of like college football's power the powers that be have always said, well, all the argument about who should be in the national championship game gets people talking about college football. Yeah, for negative reasons. And right now we're talking about the NFL not because of all the great plays that go on, the great games that are being played. We're talking about the NFL because they can't get the game right. And, uh, but, you well, know, it's not just uh, some of these key plays like we've been talking about, but it's like not knowing the rules. We're, we're talking about, uh, you know, marking penalties off from the wrong location marking too much yardage when it comes to penalties, I mean, you name it. Well, even, you know, we've seen a couple of games where they call the two-minute warning before the two-minute warning, before two minutes or less have been left on a clock and a half. Uh, and that's a basic thing. I think I think the average 10-year-old kid who has watched football for a year or two knows a two-minute warning occurs at two minutes or less and a half. And, and yeah. we've seen these, these guys blow that those calls. So um, it's, it's embarrassing for the league, but obviously the league has no shame, if you want to say, because, you know, after, after the... the uh, uh, after the preseason, I think that there was enough of, of motivation for the NFL after seeing how poorly those guys have performed in, in the preseason to make a change. They need to make the change. They've gone three weeks now. Uh, maybe, I guess, if there's anything you can reason for this for the NFL, they can say, well, at least... 
they're bad, but they're equally bad. They're bad for everybody. Uh, they're bad for the home team. They're bad for the visiting team. Nobody gets an advantage because they're bad for everybody. So that's the only thing they could possibly say is that there's no competitive advantage for anybody because, you know, their, their bad calls are being spread out to everybody. But that's that's just terrible. The fact that these oh, guys are out there. I mean, if, if the Detroit Lions or the Green Bay Packers or, for that matter, I guess, New England, uh, if, if these teams miss the playoffs by a single game, somebody's yeah. going to mention it. Oh, of course. And, and, and that happens even if, you know, there's a, a, a deal struck today. You can't take back that Green Bay lost the game they shouldn't have lost. Again, the New England-Baltimore game, it was a questionable call, and I don't know that there'd be an easy way for the regular refs and Hockey Lee and his crew to get that call right or wrong in the, in the eyes of either set of fans. But last night's game was clear. Uh, and, and things like the Redskins being pushed back 25 yards uh, after a, 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 you know, a false start penalty, and then there's an unsportsmanlike conduct called when everybody's on the field, and they call one guy for an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty for being on the field uh, in a situation, and then, and then they mark off too many yards after, after that. You know, it, things like this, you, you can't take those back, you're right, and, and, and it's not to say that the Redskins would have won that game, it's, it, certainly the Green Bay would have won last night if not for the terrible call in that game, uh, but... You know, yeah, there, there's, that, that doesn't change. None of those results change if we bring the regular guys back today and get them suited up for Thursday night and this weekend, unfortunately, for those teams who have been negatively affected. And lastly, uh, Chris, when it comes to uh, baseball right now, it looks like the Washington Nationals is trying to keep ahead of the Cincinnati Reds for best record in the National League, whereas uh, the Orioles are now a game and a half behind the New York Yankees. Still too close to call the American League East, although the Yankees have the slight edge. And, uh, hey, you know, right now when it comes to the American League, the, the big races are the American League Central, the White Sox, the Tigers, who wants it? And can the Oakland A's hold off the Angels for another wild card? That's right. The uh, the O's splitting a doubleheader last night, and, and, and thus, because the Yankees won, they fall a game and a half back. But they're still... I guess there's uh, eight games left in the regular season. Yeah, it's definitely the Yankees have the advantage. They have two more with Minnesota, uh, which is a big advantage right now, whereas, uh, uh, you know, the, the Toronto Blue Jays uh, came into the season, at least, with more expectations and are trying to play the role of spoiler that the Orioles played last year, actually. Uh, uh, but what did that say about the Tigers? Uh, they had a chance to go into first place and lost two to the Twins. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And, and, and uh so the Orioles look to be solid for a wild card. You, you know, obviously they're still playing really hard, though, for that division championship. The reason being the wild cards this year, and we, we've talked about this on the air, but in case fans haven't been apprised or haven't thought about it lately, the wild cards this year, actually, it's a one game and done. The two wild card teams play a one game to, to make their way in the divisional series. So now the good news this week is if they have to go to the wild card route, they get to host it in, in all likelihood because... Uh, about two weeks ago, it looked like it was going to be Baltimore traveling to Oakland because Oakland had the better record. And provided, of course, Oakland hangs on and gets the wild card, and, you know, staves off the Angels. And uh, the, if the Orioles don't win the East, uh, they keep uh, winning a few ball games. At least the, the Orioles will get to host that one-game wild card. That's right. Yeah, but what this is doing, and it's interesting, because both in both the situations, say it's you know Baltimore right now has the best record among the wild card teams in the AL, and in the NL. Atlanta has the best record among the wild card teams. If 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 we were playing under last year's rules, it's it's not quite the same because Baltimore only has I think a one game lead over uh, over Oakland for the wild card right now. If if they were both competing for one wild card berth, but. Uh, you, if you were Atlanta, certainly Atlanta would, would be you know, in pretty good situation right now. They could start resting players and, and not worry about having to you know make the playoffs, if you want to say. Uh, but right now, if you're Atlanta's, I think four and a half back of the of the Nationals in the uh, or maybe five back now because the, the, yeah. they were idle last night. But they Atlanta still has it's an outside shot, but an outside shot at least of winning the National League East. And, and there's incentive for them to try to do so because if you can win the division, then you you know you you get a full division series. Whereas if you're the wild card team, it's a one and done situation. So uh, you, right, you, the the powers that be in Major League Baseball looked at this last year and said we we don't want to basically incentivize these wild card teams to, to rest the last week. We want them to to have something to play for. And in both cases, both Atlanta and, and, and Baltimore have a lot to play for, which is you know if they if they can go out and win their divisions, then uh, they and, and also it makes both the Nationals and the Yankees play for a lot more too because it's not like if, if somehow the Nationals were to tank this last week, uh, then you still get you know a full divisional series against somebody else. Then you've got a one and done. So uh, the Nationals still have to go out and play hard. The Yankees still have to go out and play hard. So do the O's and and the Braves. And and that's creating more excitement around baseball. There's still even though you know even in the National League, there's still quite a few teams. In the, in, in the mix for that second wild card berth, there's still a few
few teams in the AL in the mix for that second wild card berth. And as a result, there's a lot more excitement across baseball. Very, uh, to me, a very good decision by Major League Baseball to do what they did. Chris, to wrap things up, uh, what do we look for in the coming days sports-wise from the Augusta Free Press and Virginia Sports Online? Well, we'll focus our attention on college football, our local teams, Virginia, Virginia Tech, JMU, and VMI. And uh, we'll also probably uh, rhapsodize a bit about the uh, replacement refs. I can't imagine that I won't write a column or two about that. Uh, uh, so, so a lot of football. Of course, baseball is wrapping up the regular season, and we have to focus on those, those local teams, too. So there's a lot to keep our attention right now as, as September rolls on. Okay, Chris Graham with the Augusta Free Press and Virginia Sports Online. Back more of online here on this Tuesday on AM 1450 right after this.